Welcome to our second stop in a four-part series of visiting Andover, Massachusetts in a virtual setting. For us at ASA, this is a new approach. Usually we go to school districts and get to talk with teachers directly and get to talk with students and sit next with that, next to them and have really good in-depth conversations. Um, so Shelly and your team, we greatly appreciate the fact that you are our first virtual site visit. There'll be others. So uh, what we learn from this visit will be applied to others. You can come back and, and you'll, you know, be our consultant, advise other groups about what works and what doesn't work. Um, we're really pleased that with this cohort, this social emotional learning cohort, we get to visit Andover because Dr. Berman is one of the leaders nationally, uh, having worked with the Aspen Institute, with Linda Darling Hammond, with others across the country, with Castle, um, in, in looking at uh, SEL generally, and then having um, been an author, the lead author, for uh, advice and, and practical implications in practice uh, implementing SAL. So, so our title today is looking at implementation um, and, and looking at not just at, at the concept of social emotional learning, but its connection to being culturally responsive. So let me introduce to you one of the co-chairs of our social emotional learning cohort, um, with Shelley and with Eric Gallian from uh, Racine, Wisconsin, and Michael Rice, who's the Commissioner of Education in Michigan. So Janet Robinson is Superintendent in Stratford, Connecticut. Uh, so this is a wonderful another day in and now working together as colleagues uh, looking nationally at SEL, but more specifically what we can learn locally from a leading school district in the country on um, SEL. So Janet, it is my pleasure to hand over the reins or the virtual reins to you. Thank you, Mort. I appreciate that. We're very pleased to be making our sec second stop at Andover. Um, we were very impressed with the kinds of things we learned on the first stop. So um, my colleague, Dr. Shelley Berman, is a superintendent in Andover, and I'd like to give him uh, turn this over to him for a moment so he could introduce his uh, panel that'll be here with us today. Shelley. Thanks, Janet. Really appreciate that. Um, and we're really, really looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have today and the exchange and the, 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 uh, the bit of uh, information that you're going to have and, and be able to access in terms of the second stop. The first stop we made was really looking at policy and looking at leadership and, and uh, what how did we support this work uh, at a central office and uh, school board level? We're now uh, turning to our, our attention to the people who are on the ground who have to implement this and lead this on the ground. And it's a, a great group that you'll be meeting. Talking about our work in responsive classroom and building community uh, is Jason DiCarlo, who's the principal of the Sanborn Elementary School. Uh, Robin Wilson, who's a principal of Doherty Middle School, will talk about a program that we've launched where everybody belongs, uh, which has been ad adopted by all our middle schools. Uh, Phil Conrad, who's the principal of Andover High School, has worked extensively on personalization uh, and social emotional learning through an advisory program that we call HBlock. Uh, Adrian Bach has been the leader of our social studies uh, program K-12 and has been working on a new curriculum that integrates social emotional learning in a, uh, a way that stretches into civics and civic engagement. Sarah Kalea is our literacy program coordinator for K-5 to and has been doing extensive work in culturally responsive approaches to literacy and building classroom libraries that are diverse. And then uh, Joe Yared, who's our social work program coordinator, who is actually uh, coordinating a lot of the work in trauma and mental health, which we're uh, is a, a, I know a topic that many of us are, are really working hard to address. Um, if you go to the next slide, I want to frame a little bit about uh, Andover and uh, where we are and where we're going uh, to give you a little bit of a sense of this. Uh, Andover is a community about 30 miles north of, of Boston. Uh, we're a suburban community. Uh, there's 6,000 students in the community and uh, we have 10 schools, including a uh, preschool. Um, but we have a philosophy that uh, is, puts a, uh, children at the center in terms of their social and emotional well-being, as well as their academic needs. This is a quote that came out of uh, the study at, uh, and actually the National Commission, which was uh, from a nation at risk to a nation at hope 
I hope if you haven't seen that, it's a great document with lots of resources and there, there are uh, practice documents that go with it and research documents. It's a wonderful resource for everyone. But what we have focused on is our strategic goals, and, and we have four major strategic goals. But the first one centers in on the caring and culturally responsive classrooms, because we feel that that is a uh, sort of the, the ground on which we work. That's the, the setting for all of our, our other work. So we build our rigorous curriculum on top of that inclusive instruction to ensure that all students are included. Uh, that includes not only uh, special needs students and English language learning students, but it also different cultures and races. And so we, we look at a broad cultural, cultural inclusion. And then progress monitoring to see how we're doing, not only in terms of the academic progress, but social emotional progress as well. The core belief around our work in social emotional learning is that the social curriculum is as important as the academic curriculum and we have to spend as much time thinking about it in a coherent and cohesive way so it has the kind of consistency that we would have with the academic curriculum just as we're looking at a scope and sequence in the academic curriculum we're also looking at scope and sequence in our social emotional learning program you're seeing here a morning meeting in one of our fourth grade classrooms uh, of a teacher you will be uh, if you attend next time you will be talking to uh, next time uh, emily allen we see four core practices that are part of our work uh, one is direct social skill instruction that students need to learn those basic skills and that they may not have uh, coming into the school setting. So social skill instruction is really critical in terms of conflict resolution, in terms of collaboration, resolving differences, uh, being able to take the perspective of another. And another uh, one is uh, the integration into academic instruction. So how do we tie this in in a way that enables uh, our curriculum to reflect the kind of culture and skills that we want to develop in students. And I think Sarah Kalea will be talking more about that kind of integration, as will Adrian Bach. We're also looking at classroom climate and classroom culture. You know, students have to live the experience that we're teaching. And so what is that culture and how do we, uh, in a sense, facilitate a culture and climate in classrooms and schools that really reflects and models what we want students to become and how we want them to uh, behave with each other. And then frankly, we need practical experience. Students need to be able to take those skills and act uh, on those skills in the real world. And so we have a fairly extensive service learning and community service program across all our schools where students are able to participate. Lastly, I just wanna lay this out and then I'm gonna turn this back to Janet. We, we have a systemic approach. So you take those four elements of social emotional learning instruction, curricular integration, community building and service, and we've essentially define programs and resources and approaches that address each one of these. So for example, in social skill instruction, we use second step and, and open circle at the elementary level and middle school level. Um, at, we, at curricular integration, we do a great deal of our work is around collaborative learning and collaborative teaching. Uh, we have uh, designed into our curriculum culture and literature, which you're gonna hear a good deal about. And actually at the high school level, we have worked a lot with a, a program called Facing History in Ourselves, which is a, a program that looks at diversity and teaching to diversity and teaching about uh, prejudice and, and uh, racism. The, we build community through a program called Responsive Classroom, which you're gonna hear student councils and where everybody belongs, which you're also gonna hear about, and frankly, HBlock, which is our advisory program at the high school. And then service learning is built across all grades. So this is sort of our larger systemic approach and you're now going to be hearing a lot about that from the people who are on the ground <clears throat> and doing this work. So, Janet, you're, you're welcome to, to begin the conversation. Shelley, that's great. You've really helped us see the context um, with which this, uh, this fits. So let's uh, ask the panel now to uh, give us their opinion on a few of these things and their experiences. So, Joe, I'd like to start with you. Joe, why is... Uh, social emotional learning and uh, culturally responsive practice really important to you. Hi everybody, first I, I just wanna um, thank the AASA for having us here today and um, say it's, uh, it's really an honor 
to be here with my friends and colleagues from Andover. <clears throat> um, the social emotional learning and culturally responsive practices, it's, I think we find ourselves in a really kind of fascinating time right now where, um, to reflect upon this question, we have a global pandemic, which is um, causing a lot of disruptions, um, not just for our schools, but I think for um, our students and our families and our communities, and especially in regards to mental health. And in addition to that, we have this uh, growing movement of protests and demonstrations, um, really kind of based on longstanding and culturally ingrained uh, racial inequities and abuse of power, um, which is becoming front and center in conversations that we're having, not just with ourselves and our families, but in our, with our students as well. Um, I think it's whether we're social workers or educators, uh, just peoples of conscious, um, we have a, an ethical responsibility to really build systems and structures and cultures that honor and value all human beings, especially in respect to identity. SEL and, um, and culturally responsive practice, they're, they're not mutually exclusive terms, nor should they be. Um, they're both really integral to uh, the drive that, cultivate, that we want to cultivate and nourish as far as uh, human awareness and how we live and interact with each, with each other and healthy relationships. Um, you think about like the castle uh, wheel, uh, you know, uh, self-awareness and social awareness and relationship skills. Um, these all um, are, are skills directly related to empathy and compassion and the emotions that really connect us to each other in the most mm -hmm. meaningful ways. I think for me, and thinking about this question, like the bottom line really is, you know, students come to us and they will tell us who are their favorite teachers. What classes do they feel the most comfortable? What are the most important things that, what are the most important elements that are present for them in those classes um, that make it such a great place for them to be? And, and really they, they talk about it, you know, they talk about safety and relationship. And I think those two elements are the core to beginning discussions that I have with people around the district around how we start to, um, how we start and then continue to build upon social emotional learning and then having um, really good culturally responsive practices. Um, I'll end my piece just a little bit where I started um, and thinking about you know, what's happening in our society. Um, I was reading this Dan Brown book a little while back and uh, he had a quote from uh, Dante Alighieri in there and I think it's very, very um, relevant to where we are today. And basically he says, the darkest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain the neutrality in times of moral crisis. And um, I don't think we've ever been neutral and nor should we be. And the, the better we can um, inspire others to come out of that safe space and get out of their comfort zone and be able to start to uh, address some of the inequities that we're facing today, uh, the better off we'll be for all of us. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. I can see there's a lot of uh, passion in, in, uh, in your mission. So I appreciate your sharing with us. Hey, hey Janet, this is Mort. I've uh, never heard Dan Brown quite quoted in that regard, but, <laughs> but Joe, that was terrific. And, and I think it strikes to, the, to where we should be as professionals across the country. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you for making that very real. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Jason, uh, following up on, on the, Joe's passion, what are some of the ways that you have uh, set up to implement uh, SEL and the culturally responsive program? Hi, everyone. Um, so, <clears throat> whereas, uh, 23 years ago, I had an administrator, my first year teaching, um, I had a principal say to me, I'm going to send you to Responsive Classroom Institute. Um, and it was an institute for four days where um, I learned some incredible ways on how to support kids, um, as well as um, some best teaching practices. So, you know, Responsive Classroom has been around for a long time, um, started right here in Massachusetts in Greenfield. Um, so I'm a huge, huge fan of um, Responsive Classroom. And it's evolved over the years. There are four domains, and some of this you've already heard, which is engaging academics, um, develop responsive teaching, effective management, and positive community. Um, and I think all of those beliefs are rooted in also what we talked about in terms of you have to integrate the social emotional skills as well as the academic skills. Um, but for me, um, 
five hallways um, is part of the responsive classroom um, core standards, um, the positive community has always been something that's been ha a passion for me as a teacher, but then also as an administrator. Um, and so in the three schools where I've been a principal, um, I have brought forward um, morning meeting and closing meeting as part of a, a full school implementation. Um, so I was excited when I came to Andover my first year that um, there were some teachers who um, were taking the, the responsive classroom training. Um, and I think morning meeting is, is something um, that's great because it helps to create a safe, predictable, and joyful, um, inclusive classroom where all students feel a sense of belonging and significance. As a principal, I'm big into structures and predictability. So um, it's, a, it's a great um, habit to get into. Um, and so when I came to Andover, I approached the, the um, teachers um, from my school, that a couple of them that had taken the, the training, and asked for their feedback and said, you know, what do you think about bringing this school-wide? Um, and they agreed. They thought that, that morning meeting was a great way to, to build community and a sense of belonging. So um, we worked together, and my first um, faculty meeting or our first orientation um, I worked with them and we modeled a morning meeting and you can sort of see that picture, um, in the middle where the entire staff was sitting in a circle. Um, and they weren't terribly comfortable with that. It was something very, very different than what they were used to. Um, but we modeled a morning meeting, which consists of four parts, a, a, a greeting, a morning message, a sharing activity, and just a, a group activity. And um, what we did is we constructed as a staff why those might be beneficial for students, and why it would help to create a sense of belonging in class and community. Um, and they came up with all of the exact answers that would come out of the formal responsive classroom training. So um, by the end of the two hours, um, we had really kind of had a, a pretty solid shared understanding of um, why morning meeting would be a worthwhile um, structure um, that we would build into our day. And so um, after that, we, we, I gave the, the staff the, the choice and, into some input on how we might go full school K to five. Um, and we determined that um, we would take one month and focus on one area of morning meeting. So in September, it was the greeting, October was the message, um, and then they would include um, the, the sharing and the greeting um, in the other months so that we would have full implementation by January. And for each of those months, we were able to support each other with resources um, and different skills um, that might help them to, to fully implement. Um, and so we did have full implementation. There's a couple of pictures there um, of morning meetings happening. Um, you can sort of see in the upper corner, there's messages. Um, that's from the same teacher. Um, you can see her first message in 2017 um, versus her message um, just this week where she's had to go virtual. So we're still having morning meetings virtually um, and how her message has, has changed and grown over the years. Um, one of the things with morning meeting that you, um, a, a possible obstacle um, is the time. You know, how do we make time for this? Because there's never enough time. Um, but I felt as a, as a school leader, I was passionate about this. And so we built time in the schedule. And you can kind of see down there um, that we have morning meeting across the board in all classrooms for first thing in the morning. So um, having that in the schedule um, and me sort of saying, it's okay to give up some time for other stuff so that we can have morning meeting each day, um, I think gave the teachers a bit more permission to sort of um, adopt and implement it. Um, and again, three years later, I think they've become incredibly masterful in integrating content. Um, some of their morning meetings could go as long, you know, 30 to 40 minutes, believe it or not, but they're, they're actually engaging kids in meaningful academics, um, still using that structure. Um, and I know that there's always that idea of data, and so on either side, uh, we ask teachers, you know, has it become a habit in your classroom? And when we talked about structure, I think, um, habit kind of relates to structure. And the scale there, zero to four, four being strongly the, agree, um, was that teachers strongly agreed that um, morning meeting has become a habit in their classroom. 
as well as starting the day has had a positive impact on their, their classroom community. So um, that's just a little bit of, of how I've integrated morning meeting or brought morning meeting um, full scale um, to Sanborn. That's wonderful, Jason. They're able to carry this, this habit, you say, the structure of morning meeting into the virtual learning. That's, that's a great connection for kids. Thank you. Um, who else has a, has a, want to share their ways of implementing? Sure, I can, I'll be happy to, to go next. I'm Robin Molson. I'd also like to say thank you for inviting us to be here. It's exciting. And I think the work that we do is very exciting. And um, I'm at a middle school. I'm one of three middle schools. And what we do to build on the work that the elementary schools are doing around social emotional learning is we begin our year and have a program throughout our year called WEB, where everybody belongs. It is actually part of the Boomerang Project. Um, the Boomerang Project focuses on transition from um, elementary to middle and then from middle to high school. And it's really around uh, student mentoring and leadership, which is a really beautiful thing, especially when you think about young adolescents. So every year, our um, eighth grade student, our seventh grade students actually have the opportunity to apply to be trained as a student leader. And they go through about 16 hours of training over the summer that obviously is very, it's voluntary. Um, and I have three program advisors that have gone through extensive training themselves with the Boomerang, uh -huh, the Boomerang Project. Um, to develop the leadership skills for these young people. And then what these, this group of um, leaders do, and you can see them behind me, this is our, our uh, group this year, um, is that they reach out to our sixth graders before the school year begins and they introduce themselves and they say to the kids, you know what, you're going to be okay and this is who I am and we're going to work together and I've got your back kind of a thing. And you can imagine that for a young sixth grader coming in to a new school, that first relationship is so critically important and that idea of um, really feeling like you matter to someone. And that's exactly what the, um, the program does. It tells our young sixth graders, you matter, I care about you. And then when they bring the kids in, we each of our middle schools has uh, more than one feeder school. So I have two schools that, two elementary schools that come into my school. And the other two middle schools also have multiple elementary schools that come in. So these kids are coming together without having been together for five or six years. We're K to K five schools. Um, so, and then we have a lot of students that move in. So the very first day of school, our eighth graders are greeting them off the bus. And we actually have a virtual plan just in case for this year uh, so that our kids will continue to have that greeting. And then they spend the first part of their day with the um, eighth graders in the program advisors. In fact, I um, have been banished from uh, their area. They tell me, you cannot come, Mrs. Wilson. And if I'm approaching, they, they come out and they say, what can we help you with, Mrs. Wilson? So it's really mm -hmm. a neat thing uh, to watch uh, the kids go through. And the eighth graders take it very seriously. And one of the links that I had put in um, to the slide, and I, I would encourage you if you're interested in just seeing it real time, is listen to my eighth graders because um, we interview them for part of uh, the video because for them to, to be seen as leaders and they're not my top scholars and they're not the students that maybe are the, com the, the community stars on a sports team. They are students who are passionate about being a part of a change and reaching out and wanting to make um, a difference. And so they you know, as much as we say this is for their trend, the six incoming sixth graders transition into middle school, it really too is about the eighth graders developing that sense of self mm -hmm. of who I am of using my, my words and my voice in a very positive way. Um, and, and for working, you know, sixth, seventh and eighth grade is, is our middle schools. Um, these young people are, are, 
thrown into a tumultuous time developmentally, trying to figure out who they are and really being able to make that relational um, commitment and knowing that you are important at that and that we go, uh... too, um, is, is um, incredible. Um, so that's really about our web. Um, the high, it does have a high school component that goes along with it. Um, and it's called Link Crew. And the whole idea is really um, having students helping Thank students you. and really bringing in their agency and developing their capacity. So we take our young students from elementary school and we build upon those social emotional skills of empathy and using your voice and um, being a responsible and uh, community member and we position them to then uh, go on to the high school. So that's uh, a little bit about web. Um, again, there's, you can see there are multiple links that I would encourage you to, uh, to visit. That's wonderful. Everyone talks about the, the angst of going through middle school and so forth. And it sounds like you have really developed something here that really helps students feel comfortable coming in and feeling confident when they leave. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wonderful. Would anyone else on the panel like to also join in in terms of how you've implemented SEL and, and culturally responsive practice? Janet, I'd just like to add to what Robin was saying. Um, I'm at the high school level, and we have three schools coming into the high school. Our, our high school is quite large. It's about 1,800 kids. Uh, and we have a number of programs that pick up on the peer mentoring that they get in the web opportunity. We have our students to students group, which reaches out to the eighth graders as they come in. And I agree with Robin, that first relationship is really so very, very important. So our students to students have that, our ambassadors um, create that. Because, you know, going back to the first question, why is it so important? We really, learning can't happen if you're not feeling confident and safe. And, and your emotions are, are, you know, your emotional well-being's got to be taken care of. And I think that, for all of us, is the bottom line. Um, our H block is, um, and I, I know it's a foolish name, but it is what it is. Uh, our H block is a regular class period. It has as much time as any other course. Uh, it's got two components to it. And I'll try to throw up my slides here for a second. You can just see it. Um, it what it does is it gives you the opportunity to have students, uh, they, they get a chance to be with their teachers um, for some of the time, but they also get to be in an advisory program, and that's our H1. So H1 meets five times, uh, once out of every eight days, um, just as part of our schedule. This is an H block group that was together for the junior prom and it was really wonderful to see them all say, oh, we got to get our H block advisory group together and that's what the, they took their picture. But it's really the teachers and the students creating an opportunity to build a relationship from freshman year through senior year and an opportunity for them to have a curriculum that grows with them so that they're able to understand what it's like to come to a highly academic high school as a freshman, and then to understand how do I want to leave this place as a senior? What are the things that I need to do to make sure that the legacy I leave is one that makes it makes our school a kinder, uh, more caring, more inclusive place? And I think that those are some of the most important parts of our uh, H block curriculum as we move forward. So that's just one of the things that we have going on at the high school. It sounds interesting. It sounds like kids are really bonded by the time they finish their high school career. So who else on the group would like to share on the ways you've been implementing? Uh, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Adrian. I'm the K-12 Social Studies Coordinator. And I'm going to speak to you about um, the elementary social studies program that we've been developing uh, in Andover. It's called One Community, One Nation. Um, like Phil just said, and I think so many of us feel on this panel, we understand that unless students feel identity safe in their classrooms, in their buildings, um, unless they have the opportunity to see themselves in the stories they're reading and the stories they're studying, then they're, they're not going to be open to developing understandings. So I think that's why, you know, I think that's something across, like Phil said, across this panel, and I'm sure across everyone is here, 
that's what motivates our work. So One Community, One Nation is a K-5 to elementary social studies uh, program that we are building and developing in Andover. Um, it is a social studies program that integrates with the arts and with literacy. And, you know, there's lots of pieces to it. And, um, but when I, when I think what the real goal of One Community, One Nation is, its goal is to develop this set of seven disposi civic dispositions that you see on the right hand of the screen here. And we have many ways in which we work to develop these dispositions in our students. So the dispositions include commitment to social justice, individual responsibility, promotion of the common good, open-mindedness and critical-mindedness, compassion, and negotiation and compromise. Um, we think about developing these both curricularly but also instructionally, so I'll share a little bit about how we're doing that. So OCON explores a number of themes and topics um, to develop these dispositions, uh, and really the three main themes and concepts that we're trying to develop in students are the themes of community, civics, and culture. So, and this really happens in a spiraling way. Um, we really look at these three concepts throughout all six years of the program, and we return to them over and over again. In kindergarten and grade one, we really reflect on and ask the question of what does it mean to be a member of a community? Uh, in grade two, we focus on cultures from around the world, um, some of which are present in our classrooms in our district, and we explore how does diversity benefit a community and contribute to the common good? In grade three, we focus on civics, and we really look at what does it mean to and how can we make a difference in our communities. So we spend time looking at stories of people globally and locally who have made a difference in their community. And then we ask students uh, to themselves participate in their communities by engaging in service learning at the end of grade three. And then in grades four and five, we return really to the idea of community and membership by studying case studies uh, within U.S. history. And we're looking explicitly at how people in the United States have expanded rights uh, to create a more inclusive community. So in K and one, we really think about what does it mean to be a member of a community? And we return to that idea by also folding in the concepts of civics and culture. And then in grades four and five, explore really how the boundaries of membership in the United States have changed over time and what and who the individuals were who made that happen. So for example, we might look at um, the abolition of slavery in grade four, and we look at a text uh, called Before She Was Harriet that looks at the story of Harriet Tubman's life. We explore the abolition of child labor, also in grade four, by exploring the photographer Lewis Hine, whose photographs actually push legislation to end child labor in the United States. So it's really a combination of thinking about um, what does it mean to contribute to a community and who are some people who have done that. We also have incorporated a few instructional frameworks that I think really help us practice these dispositions over and over again. Um, so the first set of the first instructional framework or instructional strategies that we that we use are thinking routines that were developed by Project Zero at Harvard Harvard Grad School of Ed. And these thinking routines really ask students to slow down their thinking um, and to also rely upon and recognize the knowledge of the community around them. So we might ask students to explore a primary source um, or an artifact re related to one of the topics we're studying by using a see, think, wonder, where, they're, where they see that asking questions of each other is as important as determining any kind of answer. What, what does this artifact make you wonder about? And then maybe we'll explore those questions together. What does it make them wonder and how can we find out some answers? Um, they may also use a, a thinking routine that says, I used to think, now I think, where they fill in the blanks. And it really asks students to reflect on how their own thinking has grown and changed and how the thinking of their peers has grown and changed. Uh, so we try to embed these thinking routines throughout each unit of study. Um, and the other instructional framework that we have bolded into One Community, One Nation is a, a literature framework called the Performance Cycle. And that was developed by an individual out of Brown University or a few individuals out of Brown University. Uh, and we pair these some meaningful texts with the stories that we're telling uh, in our units of study. And we're exploring these texts through the performance cycle where students are really paring down text, performing text. It takes a very performative approach to reading um, and who are there actually creating text and in, in many cases also creating 
art to represent their thinking as they experience these texts and as they explore the primary sources um, related to the stories we're telling. So, you know, again, this is all in the service of developing these civic dispositions to get students to recognize that we all need to be contributing members to our communities. Um, so I think I'll pause there because I could talk for a long time about this, but I'll stop <laughs> and uh, we'll, I'm sure the conversation will be. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you have a, a lot of strong feelings about this and certainly you're enthusiastic about it. It's very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Sarah, you must have something you want to tell us about your, your implementation of SEL. Sure, I would love to. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Sarah Kalea. I'm the literacy coordinator um, for K-5 in Andover. I think that the implementation of SEL and cultural responsive practices um, in terms of literacy has really been twofold. Um, first, we worked hard to build classroom libraries in every classroom that would represent many diverse cultures in many different ways. So um, we are conscious that, you know, children of color should not always see themselves as, you know, an oppressed victim in a book that can be traumatizing. Um, so we want to make sure that our libraries of, are full of stories of children of all races, nationalities, and cultures doing typical everyday things. Like you can see Jabari jumps, he's just going to go for a swim, you know, or the book Saturday. Um, it's a book about a typical Saturday. And um, we, we want to make sure that we supplement our classroom libraries with lots of these kinds of stories so that our students can see themselves and each other and people they might not know very much about um, doing all kinds of things. Um, because as Adrian referenced, you know, it, it is important for students to be able to um, learn about people that they might not interact with through literature. So Windows and Mirrors um, is a theory about the windows being a view into a culture you might not be familiar with and the mirrors being a view into yourself to help your own develop, um, identity development. Um, and to um, the extent that we have implemented Reader's Workshop in the past couple of years, um, it has allowed for a time of day called independent reading, which you're probably all aware of, where students choose their own reading materials. Um, and so giving them a really robust classroom library um, with lots of choices has been a big step in that implementation. At the same time, we've been implementing Fontes and Pinnell Classroom, which is um, a pretty new curriculum, only a couple of years off the press. Um, and what is amazing about this curriculum is that it comes with text sets of interactive read-alouds that are incredibly diverse. And what I'm showing you now is um, a glimpse at what the reading mini lessons look like in the curriculum. And the literary analysis mini lessons really invite a lot of reflection and conversation about these deeper themes. So in grade one, um, we're looking at books from three different cultures, well, the first one is mouse culture, um, but you know, it, it is a diverse text set. Um, and it's about how does the character feel? So we're instilling empathy in students. And as they think about how a character might feel, they can think about how they might feel in a situation like Julius feel, um, you know, is the baby brother and lots of kids have had a baby brother or a sister so they can relate to the character. Then moving into um, Amazing Grace, you can see that um, she's actually discriminated against in school. And so when we talk about um, a story like that in a book, it opens up the conversation for students to also talk about their own experiences. And then by the time the curriculum moves into grade four, um, it focuses on human challenges and social issues. So, you know, the curriculum comes with these read alouds that include such themes as equality and acceptance. And then, um, you know, this is a two mother household in our mother's house by Patricia Polacco. So, um, we go from examining feelings in books all the way up to how does this now translate out into the world and these greater themes that we need to be conscious of and be able to discuss openly. Wonderful, thank you for sharing, Sarah. I appreciate it so much. And I, I think we wanna just have Joe talk about trauma for just a minute before moving on to the impact. When we talk about social emotional learning, a big piece to, um, the, the student base that we're really trying to um, um, 
make accommodations for is uh, students of trauma, students who have experienced trauma. And, you know, there's, there's different levels of trauma, there's acute trauma, there's chronic trauma, there's community trauma, um, there's personal, and it's just, I think within our classrooms, we can look out and we know, um, going by studies that, that are looking at trauma, that, you know, we have, a, a, you know, anywhere from three, three out of, you know, three to five, um, three to five, 30 to 50 percent of our students um, have, are coming to our classrooms with some sort of trauma. Um, and how we address that, um, certainly it is based in the climate and the culture that we're able to develop in our classrooms. And like I said earlier, we have, um, um, you know, we, we have this, uh, we have uh, an opportunity here to, to really delve deep into um, how we kind of provide that for students and, and really safety and relationship being the, the two core elements that I think um, are most important, at least to start. Um, we at Andover and Andover High School, uh, we've developed or we've implemented this program called Renew, um, which is an intervention model for tier three, tier three students um, who are at the high risk of dropout, um, high risk of, of for high risk behaviors such as substance abuse and um, aggression and such. Um, and the, the Renew model is developed through uh, University of New Hampshire's um, Institute on Disability. And, and really what uh, RENEW stands for, it stands for rehabilitation, um, empowerment, natural, re national, natural resources, education and work. And it's a, it's a, it's a person-centered model that really helps students to develop um, a voice and a say in how they develop their goals. Um, what I'd like to do is share um, a screen of, of how we start to do that. Um, there's a mapping process that's involved that has students really kind of delve deep into their lives. And these are just two of the maps that I've done with uh, my students. I, I work with two students currently uh, with Renew. Uh, one's a high school student and one is a student in eighth grade going up to the high school. And um, they did give me permission to share these, these maps. And you kind of work, you walk students through all these different various aspects of their life where you're starting with my history and, and, and going into areas around their, their circles of support and people in their lives that, that are important. This other map over here, what works and what doesn't work. Um, what we're trying to do is get students to, to really kind of be able to verbalize and, and using the maps as a, as a visual representation of that, um, to, to think deeply about what it is that, that they that they need us to know as adults that are working with them in their lives in order for them to be able to accomplish goals. Um, again, it's, a, it's, it's part of a, a person-centered planning process. The ultimate um, end product is a goal that gets the student not just to graduation, but beyond. So um, as, we're, as we're working and refining goals with students throughout their, um, their high school career, however long we have them, um, the goals can shift and change depending on how students are achieving them and working towards them um, with always uh, a focus on, you know, next steps and, and, and the, this idea that, you know, we're, we're lifelong learners and we never, we never really stop. Um, so I did want to share, that was uh, just one of the maps I did want to share um, with one model that we use um, to help students that are at, you know, really high, um, high risk and high need. But, you know, one of, one of our, this cohort's earlier sessions was on uh, trauma and how that affects students. So Shelly, I'm so glad you, you helped redirect me back to, to this discussion. This was really important. Okay, so um, Robin, we're gonna come back to you. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I, think it, I think people can see that part of what makes um, this work so impactful is the continuous, um, in willingness of um, teachers and staff members to keep this complex conversation going forward. So because of that, we're able to create um, programs and things that our students and our teachers need, teachers in the area of professional development, but for our kids really designing and implementing curricula or um, transition programs like web 
um, that really build on that core human condition of belonging and relationship. Um, for us at the middle level, um, since having implemented web, what have we seen? We've seen um, such a decrease in the number of student truancies. Um, kids are coming to school. They want to come to school. They feel connected to their teachers. They feel connected to one another. And if, if you are a middle school person, you know that that's not always the case. You know, middle school kids can be uh, a little... Um, challenging at times um, but we really see with since implementing web and we've had web in the district for about 10 years um, and it's really just gotten into the three of our schools uh, in the last three years so um, some one of our schools has been using web for a longer period of time but we see a decrease in truancy we see a decrease in referrals for um, uh, any kind of behavioral referral. The kids are, we are building with our kids the opportunity to have a voice to in, in the understanding that their voice matters and uh, an outlet for them to share their voice. So the behavioral pieces that um, we had seen historically have really diminished. Um, and other kinds of referrals um, have also gone down, but it's not, I don't, I, I, you know, not one of our, not any of our schools just has one thing that we do. We have a multiple um, sets of things that we do and, and put in place for our kids and for our students. I invite my colleagues to share um, a little bit more and build on that. Yes. Phil, that, Phil, would you mind sharing with us and build on that? How, what have you seen has been the impact on the students and on the teachers? Sure. So um, let me see if I can share some. We have some data uh, that we've been collecting over the the last few years about how the H block has impacted everybody. So we asked people, um, parents, students, and teachers about the positive impact of their relationship building. And this was immediately after we implemented it. So this was in, after year one. We've had the uh, new schedule on the H block for three years now. Uh, so you can see that um, the parents and the teachers and the students all found that they were having more positive relationships uh, because of the H block opportunity. We also saw that for the students and the teachers and the parents, it also was re decreasing academic stress. It was giving students an opportunity to spend time with their teachers, going over the things that they wanted to go over, to learn more about some of the things, to just build those relationships, and to get the extra help that they needed during the school day. It also gave our kids chances to work together on projects and over geographically for our area, a large uh, school district. So it was an opportunity for kids to be able to get together during the school day instead of having to try to figure out how to get together after the school day was over. And then finally, um, a positive impact on student progress. And you can see that all three groups said yes, it was having a positive impact, particularly the teachers. You can see the teachers there at 51% um, with the strongly agree uh, or the agree part there. Uh, so that that was the really the, the best part for us is that there was really uh, a number of things that people thought uh, was happening well with HBlock and that we were able to collect that data and see that that was happening for everybody. Did you have to make revisions along the way? We have made revisions. That's a great question, Janet. Uh, we have, uh, we started out with an H block or H1 curriculum that was a curriculum that uh, we had purchased uh, early on and had been used prior with another attempt at advisory. Uh, we found that that curriculum really didn't work. And so uh, we rebuilt the curriculum in house from um, our, we had an assistant principal who took the lead. We used a number of different resources and we created a, a curriculum that was specific for each grade level and each time of the year for each grade level. Uh, and I would say to anybody who's trying to build that kind of a curriculum, uh, the health curriculum, at least the health curriculum in Massachusetts was extremely helpful for us uh, to really work in a lot of the social emotional learning that was already happening in the building and to be able to push that out into the other areas of the building and help our teachers who might not have felt as comfortable uh, feel more comfortable uh, with these kinds of conversations with students because that was one of the the concerns for for teachers 
Um, you know, I'm not a counselor. And, and really, it's not about counseling. It's not about, um, you know, going that far into things. We have professionals like Joe and, and his, his group. But what we really want to do is have people understand what it is to be the kids today, help them to navigate the world that they're in. Uh, and that was really the, the conversations that our health teachers and our assistant principal who built the curriculum really were able to help teachers have. And it sounds like you've really made it your own too. So that probably, everyone probably feels a great deal of ownership there. Adrian, do you have a, a little to share with us in this same question? What's, what do you see in the impact of students and teachers? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so I can speak, I probably can speak a little bit more about teacher impact. Um, and that's in part because we've been able to do a tremendous amount of professional development for teachers on One Community, One Nation. And there's been more professional development for teachers. And now we're following with unit creation, unit building, and unit piloting. Um, I do have some feedback from teachers about impact on students and then also my own just from having visited classes. We've heard repeatedly from teachers about the, um, how meaningful their experience at the professional development was. And we actually, you know, going back to some of the thinking routines I spoke about a minute ago, we try to use those in the professional development to give teachers practice and experience with them, but then also use them to capture some of the feedback um, from the, the experience to improve it and, and to um, make it, you know, continue to make it better. Um, so, you know, I have a couple of quotations here from teachers just with their feedback, including, I used to think that there wasn't enough time for everything new. I think if we create authentic experiences and put the disciplines in service to each other, not only can we fit it all, but we can go deeper too. How oh, perfect. So often uh, when you introduce something new, they think there's no time for it. You're putting this on top of everything else. Right. And I think that's the integration piece that um, I wasn't able to talk so much about, but, um, you know, we are trying, we're really trying, and Sarah and I have done a, a lot of work together and also with our fine arts coordinator to really be able to integrate One Community, One Nation, both into um, the literacy experiences that students are having um, and embed it sometimes into the um, interactive read aloud when appropriate. We've also really looked at integrating genre studies in um, their literacy work, like the nonfiction unit. We just piloted a unit this year um, when we were looking at um, slavery and abolition. And we were able to also align that with the historical fiction and nonfiction unit uh, for literacy. So we are really trying to, I mean, I think some of the challenges with in introducing anything new is, is that concern around what's lost and how can we fit it all. So I think we're just trying to model integration of these really important topics in integration, both uh, topical, topical integration, but also instructional integration. Um, this quotation speaks to that. I think, you know, I love, and, and what I've repeatedly heard, what we've repeatedly heard after each of these, um, of the many different Ocon institutes that we run, and that's we, what we call our professional development, um, we brought in two professional developers. As I mentioned, one is a woman named Tina Bly from the Harvard Grad School of Ed from Project Zero, and also a gentleman named Kurt Wooten from Brown University. He also, he runs a school in Mexico as well. Um, so we've been able to run a number of professional development institutes to both train teachers in the topics and themes, but also in the instructional approaches that I talked about. And I often hear feedback that's reflected in this quote that I think we all used to think, or many people used to think of social studies as about countries and, and facts and history, um, but now we understand that it can be an experience where kids are engaged, curious, excited, all while learning. So we're really trying to um, find ways for uh, kids to be really engaged. That's the feedback I hear from the teachers who are piloting both the topics, the units, and the instructional um, strategies. Um, and I also, you know, I, I know personally, I feel very engaged by the professional development that we're able to offer. And I, the feedback I get repeatedly from teachers is that they care in that engagement for the PD and are very enthusiastic about finding ways to um, roll this out with our students. Oh, the people listening in are going to love what you've had to say today. So this is really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, do you have uh, uh, something to add to this particular question about the impact? Definitely, yes. Um, I think that 
there was a striking impact um, during remote learning this spring. Um, our fifth grade team bravely decided to do a unit they had never done before, um, which was a multimedia memoir poetry unit that we kind of crafted together as a district-wide team in a Zoom call. Um, but we did it because we knew it was important for students to have a real reason to engage in their work. I mean, the fifth graders were feeling so sad to not be able to finish fifth grade um, in school with their peers and have that closure and that, um, that feeling of belonging and um, finishing up their year. And, and they were really not super engaged, you know, in the idea of remote learning. And so um, we basically um, decided to try out there's this template, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of George Ella Lyons. She wrote a poem called I Am From, and it's a, it's a very nicely structured poem, um, and it's an easy poem um, to use as a mentor poem. But the one that I'm showing you now is actually a student sample, a fifth grader. And there were so many amazing samples um, that it was hard to pick just one. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm going to read you this one. I am from technology, from TVs and video games. I am from the house by the shore, from nature, outdoors, and ice cold snow. I am from Generation Z, where we text, not talk. I am from flat screens and machines. I'm from outdoor grills and from hours of sequence. I'm from the Ramaswamis and the Chinas. I'm from badminton and soccer. From maybe, and of course not. I'm from Indian desserts that are healthy yet delicious. I'm from Newburyport and Great Indian Kings, from naan and butter chicken. I am from the time my grandpa fought off coyotes with a stick, from my cousin driving a tractor when 12. I am from captured memories hung up on almost every wall, from gold chains that link my family's history. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, and I just think that the attention to craft that we got our fifth graders to engage in um, was really unprecedented um and and it was because we focused the work on their identities and their lives very much thank you that is so important and it's a great reminder for all of us joe do you uh, do you have something you can add to this question also about the impact yeah i think um i'd like to talk a little about just the impact i think for teachers um so a few years ago um a group of us, uh, first uh, cohort from Andover, uh, participated in um, a graduate certificate program in social emotional learning through William James College. And um, it was myself, Pam Lathrop, um, Emily Allen, and um, Kira O'Keefe, sorry. As a result of that, um, we've been running a professional learning group on social emotional learning and, and opening that up to uh, teachers across the district. And we've opened it up uh, to K-12. And we've had actually really good response in, in having people um, come in and, and really kind of delve into the, the elements around social emotional learning that we're trying to help, um, you know, kind of bring out and, and, and bring awareness to throughout the school. So we've kind of structured our, our, our classes around, you know, SEL 101, um, really talking a lot about climate and culture within the classroom setting as well as the school setting. Um, trauma is a big piece of, of what we talk about in, in these classes, as well as um, culturally responsive practices. Um, so we've run our, this is our second year of running that. Um, the response has been really, really good. And in addition to us running our SEL um, professional learning group, there is a school psychologist, uh, Maisha Coleman, who also is running her own um, social emotional learning um, professional learning group as well. And I think between the, the, the two of us running our groups where we're probably capturing probably 60 to 70 staff persons per year who are really kind of motivated and, and enthusiastic about coming in and talking about and learning more about um, what it is and why we're doing it and the importance and the impact that it, it can have uh, with our students and, and also with our staff. Thank you, appreciate that very much. Uh, Jason, do you have anything to add to that same question? <laughs> I think next week um, there are some great teachers who will talk um, very much in terms of the, the, the teacher impact and the student impact of morning meeting. 
But I have very informal data that when I walk through the hallways, when morning meeting is happening, um, there are no students going to the nurse, there are no students coming to the office, um, there are no <laughs> students going to the counselor. Um, the halls are quiet and no one is walking around. So I would say there's great impact because everyone's engaged. Nothing like anecdotal um, data, right? <laughs> exactly. Very informal, like my answer. No. <laughs> but perfect. That's great. Um, so what, what have you been able to provide or how have you been able to provide uh, leadership for this work? And maybe we'll start with Phil this time. Sure. So um, I just want to jump off of what Jason said. The first time we tested H-Block and H1 particularly, um, we didn't know what to expect. And I tweeted out a picture of empty hallways because it was exactly the same thing. We were so excited. Everybody had their place. They knew where to be. They were doing the curriculum and there were empty hallways and, and nobody was in the office, the nurse, whatever. Uh, so it was awesome. And, and I really appreciated that. Um, so for, for leadership, for us, it really was about um, having the vision and making sure that you were able to explain the why. Why did we need to change? We changed a whole bunch of things, including putting the emphasis on social emotional learning. And so being able to clearly explain that to parents, teachers, students, the community, uh, because they were used to what they were used to. We had had good results. So in some ways there was a why change if it's not broken kind of um, mm -hmm. atmosphere. But we really talked about what was broken and what was being glossed over and how those things were really boiling under and hurting our students and, and really made the point over and over and over again is why this was important to our students and how it could help them and why the change was gonna be really important. So there was a lot of clarity, a lot of perseverance, a lot of really acknowledging what people thought they were losing, what, and then trying to reframe to what they were going to actually gain. Um, and we, I met with everybody. Um, that first summer, I met with parents, I met with students, I met with teachers, anybody who would have me, I met with, including elementary PAC uh, or PTOs, because those kids were going to be in our school uh, in, in no time mm -hmm. at all. And we wanted the parents to understand why it was so important. My favorite, and I'm going to only just show you the... Um, it, there's a video that is um, on the, the slides. I'm not going to show you the video, but I am going to show you this one picture. Um, uh, and this is from the video. This is my absolute favorite story. And everybody who's ever heard me talk about H-Block has heard me tell it. I had these, and there's five guys, there's five gentlemen. Uh, there's only two shown there. But the five of them started a website that said no 7 plus H dot com. That was the name of our schedule. Um, and so they had over 300 comments on their website about why this schedule that we were going to do, which included H block was going to be so horrendous and the world was going to fall apart. <laughs> so I found out about it and I called them to my office and they were kind of nervous because they thought the principal was going to yell at them. And no, I didn't yell at them. I turned to wonder and said, tell me about your website, tell me about the information, and let's talk about the schedule. Let's talk about the realities and the, the falsities that are in, in play there. Um, you know, some of the things were like, I don't want the new schedule because we're only going to have 10 minutes for lunch. Well, that's not true. So we spent about five hours, these five guys and I, um, when they were sophomores, just before the schedule went into place, we spent about five hours together. They knew the schedule better than I would say almost anybody because they, we, we went through all 300 questions. And by the time we got to about the 150th question, they were able to say, well, that's the same question as this and that's not right. And then they were able to, and then they went back out on their website and they put all the information in. Fast forward two years later, I, I was going to a conference to talk about H block. And I said to them, can you guys just go down and talk about H block, talk about the schedule and talk about, and they were, advocates for the schedule and oh by the way the video they made was done during H block um, and they're really passionate about all the stuff they were able to do during H block and how important it became to them uh, and it was it was awesome it was a it was a win but I would say it's it's really about change and about having the vision and understanding what people are thinking they're going to lose helping them reframe and see why the change is a positive thing and just persevering through it. Amazing. Donna made a comment that I was just exactly what I was thinking is, is how important student voice is in terms Absolutely. of making change. Thank you. Absolutely. That's, that's great. 
Adrian, what kinds of leadership moves uh, did you have to make? Well, I think there, I think there's a few pieces. I think um, for me, the most important one is around just inviting teachers into the process and uh, listening and incorporating the thoughts and feedback that they they are giving to us. So teachers mm -hmm. have been um, with us all along the way in uh, identifying unit. Um, unit materials, unit sequences, lesson ideas, incorporating thinking routines, texts. Um, so I, I think that that's, you know, the most important piece around making sure that the, the teachers are supported, that we're asking what they need, um, recognizing that change is hard uh, and that it takes some time. And I think everyone who's ever tried to implement any kind of change knows that. Um, so that's Probably the, the biggest thing that I think is essential for having change really take hold um, is, there, again, around that idea of stakeholder voice. I think um, that's, you know, I think that that's, that's the most important thing in my opinion. Yes, stakeholder voice is very important. Thank you for sharing that. Sarah, any, do you have any comments in terms of your say, leadership moves? You know, very similar to Adrian. It's, it's really about working closely with teachers and listening and getting to know people. Um, I think a big thing is making sure that we don't have any um, feeling like there needs to be some sort of fidelity to some written curriculum. Um, I think that's been an important shift. Um, the teachers here are smiling. Um, <laughs> It, you know, it, it, the important thing it has been engaging our hearts and minds in the work. And so to the extent that we need to get off the page of the curriculum to respond to students and bring our own hearts and minds to the work, I think that's been important. Sounds like you made them feel like they were a really important part of the process. Joe, what do you, what do you uh, see as leadership moves you've had to make? I, I think very similar to Sarah and Adrian. Um, you know, collaboration with, um, well, my, I run the social work department, so really kind of um, getting a lot of input and, um, and, and, and developing a, um, a, a coherent message and um, how, we, how we want to present that within our work with students and families and, and the building and the staff that we work with. Um, I think another part is, I think for us in my department, um, there are a lot of distractions and uh, any, kind of, any kind of crisis can come up that kind of diverts our attention away from, you know, these issues that we're moving forward. And I think the pandemic is, a, is a kind of a good example. Like our, all of our attentions were diverted. And however, we were able to come back to it very quickly and understand um, that, that these kind of events have a huge impact on mental health and the way that we respond to um, these needs in, in a way that is, you know, caring and compassion and, and, and with empathy um, and really kind of reaching out to students and families the way that we've been able to even remotely um, is, is having a huge impact or at least hopefully having a huge impact on how people are managing not just what happens in school because this is way beyond what happens in school um, but how we're supporting um, our families you know, remotely outside of school for a whole wide range yeah. of, of things that are coming up for them. Yeah, in extraordinary times. So let me let me let ask Jason if he'll just share his his uh, leadership moves in that situation. Um, I I agree with everyone in terms of the the change process. I think one big part of the change process is the idea of or when you look at the change matrix, it's the incentive, right? So what are the the benefits of it or what are people, what's the good feeling about it? And I think what everyone has presented here is that both staff and students sort of feeling that good, right? Whether it be through community, through inclusiveness, through it be having a voice. Um, so I do think a lot of it has to do with the change process, but that idea of the incentive piece um, is important. And people yeah, are feeling it, so it's sticking. Yeah, it sounds like you really paid attention to how they felt during that change process, too. It's not easy for everyone. And Robin, in our last minute, would you like to share your leadership moves? <laughs> sure. Just Actually, just building on what my colleagues have said, it's really also meeting the teachers where they're at and supporting them in, in a safe environment that they know um, that they are free to learn as they need to with sometimes a gentle push or, or nudge. 
Um, and then the, as Phil was saying, and others were saying, it's the, the others that are involved in it, really bringing that excitement and commitment forward. So that's what I would add. All right. We could speak with you for quite some time because all of you are bringing so much new learning and we appreciate your sharing your learning so that those of us that are on online with you can take this back and do some things to maybe to understand that it may take us a little while to get there, but you, you certainly helped shortcut our learning. Um, and we had other questions we wanted to ask, but we are getting near the end of the time. So I'm going to turn this back over to Shelley. Yeah. Well, before I go to Shelley, okay. Anna, thank, okay. thank you. You know, I, I'm reading the comments. There are so many in there. I can't keep up with them, but I think it's universal that folks are saying thank you. I love this one comment that said, so many pieces uh, feel deeply right. Uh, what a wonderful commendation for right. what you've done in Andover. What a great comment. Thank you, Lisa, for making that. Th this is such a rich and wonderful conversation. There were great comments about the materials you guys are putting up there, the books, the literature. Um, and and I, I'm just so impressed, and I think I speak on behalf of the 50 plus people who stayed in as part of this conversation. It was a worthwhile afternoon. Shelly, I can see your face. You're beaming with pride, as you should. These are great leaders, and thank you for sharing them with us. Yeah, they are great leaders. It's a great team to work with. So, you know, if I can say one thing, I think the, uh, first of all, thank you to the uh, team that's come on board for this this presentation and know that they are exceptional leaders and they're, they're just really talented facilitators and listeners and um, you know they what I think is so critical in this work is that we live the work and that we communicate and, and be in ways that that are we want our staff to behave and be and we want our children and students to be. So um, it, it's very much reflected in that. But I, I really encourage the people who have been on to come back for next week because and I know there's some of our teachers who are on watching this, and but it is an extraordinary group of teachers too who's been doing this work. And um, I just find it exciting to be in their classrooms to watch what they do. And, and uh, I think that'll be a uh, really thrilling for people to hear what it looks like in the classroom and how does it feel to the classroom. So I look forward to next week and, and uh, the week after that as well. So thank you. Thank you for a wonderful visit, Shelley. Thanks. Stop two, stop three coming up. <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs>